Hello, um, I'm Chair Louise Bennett and I wrote a book called Checkout 19, this one here, um, which you can kind of see, I think, back to front. Um, so Checkout 19 is a novel. Uh, it's a novel about a young working class girl growing up and uh, she has a love of, of books, all kinds of books to begin with. She doesn't really distinguish between, you know, like literature and... and uh, just nonsense books. <laughs> She's not very discerning. Um, but she becomes, I guess, more so as she gets older. So it's kind of exploring how um, these books inspired her, um, I suppose, in a, almost sort of a fantastical level, some of the kind of more fantastical uh, things that she began to sort of imagine. But then in a more sort of, I guess, um, grounded way, the sorts of ideas they gave her about what life might be like and what it might involve and what might be um, available to her in the future. Um, so she developed certain hopes, I suppose, and, and, and dreams. Um, but at the same time, she is growing up in a working class environment. Um, and that itself has its own, I suppose, expectations and demands um, that are kind of at odds with some of the notions that, that she has developing. Um, so there's a kind of, there's a tension there really between between that, this environment that she's in and what's kind of developing in, inside her and this potential that she feels that, that she has developing inside of her. Um, so there's a there's a bit of drama involved in, in all of that. Um, so I'm gonna read now from a chapter called We Were the Drama, chapter six. Um, I'm just gonna dive straight into that really. Okay. Now and then I'd take the train when I couldn't stand it anymore, which was more often than now and then, but it wasn't often that I had the money for the train then, or the wherewithal for the station, my God, which was always, whatever the time of day, very chaotic and noisy, noisy, noisy. It was noisy wherever you went from start to finish, and it was the noise ongoing I couldn't stand, I couldn't switch any aspect of it off, never could. And one day while I was on the train, the noise was there too, which wasn't always the case at the time. Quite often people on the train didn't make much sound at all because at that time none of us had a phone and we were used to sitting quietly like that with a magazine and a tea and some biscuits not making much sound at all beyond pulling at the wrapper and breaking the biscuit for dunking in the tea. Generally this I believe was what it was like on the train except one day when it was on the contrary very noisy because of all the school children and they were all moving around all boys I believe in bright blue jumpers and grey trousers heading down to Brighton I believe. That's where we were bound in any case Though they may well have disembarked sooner than that, I wasn't there to observe where exactly they got off. I left the carriage practically straight away before the train had really picked up speed. The reason why I was on it in the first place was because I couldn't stand it any longer the noise that seemed to find its way into every corner. Yet I couldn't quite distinguish from where exactly it came on it went. And there it was in the carriage, which was no good. No good to me at all. There was nothing to deliberate, you're just doing what you have to do by now, which in this case meant, of course, going out of the carriage, down those lovely narrow corridors where there are those lovely pairs of doors that slide open. There you are, in a neat little perfectly silent compartment, all on your own. No first class ticket, of course not. Never mind that. Yes, never mind that. This silence. This silence. Now everything in me could stop straining, could settle down as much as it ever could settle down and stretch out and even perhaps bask a bit. I had a packet of ginger nut biscuits with me and two of those lovely slim cans of gin and tonic from Marcus and Spencer. I have a feeling I was wearing a green hat, but I might be wrong about that. That might have been the woman I made up years later who takes a train to see friends of hers a day earlier than they expect. That's to say she arrives a day early and they are surprised, but that's only something she feels. They don't in fact express surprise in any way whatsoever. They are very welcoming and jolly nice, in fact, though somehow or other one of them, the wife probably, does of course say something about the woman being there like that a day early, but it doesn't matter, of course not. And we don't do anything much these days, do we, Drew? And it'll give us, the two of us, a chance to have a good natter because before everyone else turns up, and she is mortified, of course, and does what she can thereafter to not be there as much as possible. Starting with taking a walk around the grounds, which go on and on, and there are some very old, enormous trees, Scots pines and so on, and that's where she goes up to where the oldest Scots pines are. The Beatons are well off naturally and she came a day early and no one in fact is surprised and that's the awful thing. She had a lovely time on the train, hardly a soul on there. She had grapes, the seeded kind, I remember that bit. 
I much prefer the seeded kind, she says. They seem entire and you eat them more slowly. As for the seedless variety, she says, it's as if someone's already made a start on them. Those are the sorts of things she said, and as she went on saying them, I knew she was Charlotte Bartlett, so it gave me a great deal of satisfaction later on to disclose, after several intimations, that she'd had a brief, incredibly passionate affair with Mr Beaton Drew that did involve more than once an assignation against one of those very old Scots pines. What if it falls, she said. It won't fall, he said. It's been there for over 500 years, and I doubt we are the first. No grapes for me on the train. I wouldn't dream of going into a shop like that and putting a couple of bunches of grapes, seeded or otherwise, into a small white plastic bag like that and taking them up to the grocer at the till like that, because that's what you'd have to do. And you'd think it would be straightforward, but it seldom is. I can give you three peaches for a pound, they'll say, or how about two licorice sticks for 50 pence? How is it possible to know how likely is it that what they are offering you is something you have a fancy for? But perhaps it might be nice later on. Later on, you might be glad of three peaches and one or two sticks of licorice, but no thank you, because as it is, I've absolutely no idea how much the grapes are going to cost, no idea at all. Could be five pounds for all I know. No grapes then, and no first class ticket. Though funnily enough, that sort of thing I had no difficulty at all handling. I tucked my gin and tonic behind my bag, twisted up the biscuit packet and took my legs off the seats just before the inspector came into the compartment, proffered my standard billet and told him I'd moved in here because of a sudden terrible headache. It was terrifically noisy in second when I boarded, but perhaps it's a little calmer now. And naturally he wouldn't hear of me returning to second because for one thing I was young, not even twenty, or perhaps just about, and either way I didn't look it and for another thing people didn't seem to mind as much then as they do now. They seem to mind very much now. They're too afraid not to mind or don't have the mind not to mind. The system won't let them, etc. At one point the train stopped between stations, just came to a halt. Outside the window was wet trees and hedgerows. It was the end of autumn. There were shriveled berries and the last leaves were hanging by a thread. Nothing moved. I didn't move either. Perhaps I didn't even breathe. Once we got going again, after I don't know how long, I burst into tears. I cried and cried, my shoulders shook. Shaking the tears out of me, big fat cold autumn tears, fell straight down into my lap. Down they went, into my lap, into my lap, into my lap, into my lap. I was on the train, bound for Brighton. Okay, well thanks for listening and thank you Ema for inviting me to read for the um, advent calendar, which is a really great idea. Thank you so much and um, enjoy the Christmas season. Bye.